Wars. I'm here at the DIA with Elliot Wilhelm, who's the curator of the new Star Wars exhibit here at the DIA. Elliot, pleasure to meet you. It's great to meet you. I am totally geeking out right now. Tell us what people can expect when they visit the DIA. Well, as usual, the DIA has all kinds of things to offer for just about everybody in the family. But this summer, uh, the Star Wars exhibition is, we think, going to be bringing in audiences who may never have either visited the DIA or haven't been here for many years. Uh, it's an exhibition that families are going to absolutely go crazy over. Um, and it's an exhibition that has played in a number of other cities. It's been in Denver, uh, it's been in Portland, but uh, the Detroit installation is actually going to be its final stop in the United States before all of these people you see around me, Chewbacca, Han Solo, uh, we've, got, we've got just about every character you can imagine, droids, before they all go back to George Lucas's home in California and will be put away for perhaps another generation to see in person. So this is your last chance to be up close and personal with so many people and so many characters uh, that we've all come to know for so many, so many, almost a generation now. That's right. So these costumes and props are screen used, authentic. They come from the Lucasfilm archive. Yes, uh, and they were all, every costume you see, um, in fact, Chewbacca sitting right behind me was worn in the original uh, episode, A New Hope, back in 1977. And there are costumes and props from just about all of the Star Wars cycle, all of the major first seven Star Wars films. Um, and it's extraordinary to, to get near them, but what we really love about the exhibition is that we've been able to obtain works on paper from the Lucas archives. In other words, concept drawings, original works, concept drawings of what the characters were originally conceived as and how they evolved. So you get to be involved in the movie making process in that sense. You can't cover all of the hundreds, sometimes thousands of craft people and artists of every stripe who are working on a film like a new Star Wars picture. But we're taking a look at one aspect of Star Wars, and that is costumes. How do we identify with characters when we first see them on the screen? What's our first impression based on? And what do these characters suggest in terms of movies of the past, in terms of myths of the past in terms of stories that we already associate with because audiences related to Star Wars right away in 1977. They got in to the story. People who never went to a science fiction movie or never would have dreamed of going to a science fiction movie got it. They understood the dynamics of the story. One big part of that was what the characters looked like how they acted, what they suggested in terms of jogging our memories about other movies uh, that we love. And, and in fact, there are references within Star Wars to arts and culture from all periods. And we link those directly to specific items here in the DIA's collection. For example, uh, Darth Vader's helmet certainly suggests and is certainly based on the classic Japanese samurai helmet. We have one in our collection and the label for Darth Vader refers you to that so that you can go visit it after you've seen the exhibition. So in addition to being great for Star Wars fans, great for fashion fans, since the DIA has never really done a fashion exhibition for a long time, um, it also brings in the entire history of art and the entire history of cinema in looking at how Star Wars draws on all of those different elements to tell its story, which has gotten into the global DNA now for 40 plus years. Seeing these costumes up close, especially the ones from the original Star Wars that came out in 1977, it's remarkable how they've held up over several decades. They have, um, and they're very delicate, some of them. Uh, Chewie here uh, has, has lost a little bit of the yak hair in his wrist area, in, in his uh, lower arms, and so we had to kind of give him the uh, uh, sort of beauty shop treatment, I guess you might say, when he first got here. But yeah, these would not be circulating uh, around the country were they not still in good shape, but there's a reason that people can't actually touch them. They can get very close and pretty, pretty personal with them. We wanted to make that experience not something that was generally uh, behind glass. Some objects are, like Yoda, for example, who's a, a delicate little guy, uh, and he's the original Yoda from, from um, The Empire Strikes Back. Um, but for the most part, we wanted people to be able to see these costumes and study them 
uh, from, if possible, 360 degree perspective and get near them and to see how extraordinary, in fact, the prequels, the costumes from the prequels that, that uh, Natalie Portman wore uh, as, as Padme are really extraordinary. And when you see the films themselves, there is so much digital work and so much uh, moving imagery that's always going on. Some of those costumes were seen on screen only for a few seconds. So people will walk through the exhibition, look at them and say, I don't remember this, a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. Now you have a chance to actually see what these craftsmen did and what craftsmen do for just a few seconds of screen time. We also have in the exhibition uh, something of a reproduction of uh, an art studio that the Lucas artists originally used in order to create costumes um, and the shop in which they were created. But you begin to realize, and younger people too, begin to realize that these movies don't just appear. People go to work every day to create this vision, which ends up being a unified vision. Uh, it may be George Lucas's vision, the writer's vision. Ultimately, it's down to them to make the decision, but it relies on a huge army of craftspeople and artists conceiving of creatures. Um, you'll see in the first gallery, um, for example, uh, Darth Maul, and you'll see his costume uh, from his first appearance on screen. And on the wall, you'll see the original drawings of what Darth Maul was going to look like. Lucas suggested to the artist, he wanted him to look like your worst nightmare. He was given that drawing, and then he said, make it your second worst nightmare, because he's too <laughs> creepy. And you'll see what that original rejected version was rejected for, for being too good. So they toned him down a little. That kind of story within the story of Star Wars is what the exhibition is about. The process of creativity, and the really joyous result of all that creativity in the, in the form of these films. Like you said, this is such an amazing experience for visitors to see these costumes and props up close. What are you observing when visitors come here? Where, at what part of the exhibit do you see people really sort of geek out? The instant they walk in. Um, there are a couple of great outfits right at the beginning. One worn by uh, Padme in um, The Phantom Menace, and one worn by Alec Guinness in the original uh, Star Wars film, Obi-Wan Kenobi's robes. And for people who know Star Wars, seeing those two juxtaposed is, is quite amazing, and they haven't really even entered the exhibition yet. And for the true fan, to the left, right at the entrance to the exhibition, is the cover page of the original screenplay that Lucas wrote um, and completed in 1975, which was too big and too sprawling for any studio to sign on to. So he wasn't able to sell it in that, in that state. It had to be pruned down over a couple of years to a, a story that could be told in a couple of hours. But that cover page uh, uses the lettering that was later used in the Star Wars films receding into the background. And it was called The Star Wars. Uh, and there's a little inscription, handwritten inscription at the bottom as to what the story is going to be. And that is kind of a holy grail thing for Star Wars fans to actually be in the presence of. But of course, all of the droids, um, little behind the scenes items like uh, Chewbacca here was a very warm costume for the actor Peter Mayhew to wear. So you'll also see in this gallery where we're standing right now, um, a Wookiee cooling suit, which is a series of tubes through which were pumped cool water Audience never saw it, but it kind of saved Peter Mayhew from heat stroke more than once. Yeah. I was 10 years old when Star Wars came out, and they, the movies changed my life, and I bought all the toys and played with the toys and saw every single movie in the theater. What impact did Star Wars have on you, and what does it mean to you to be able to have access to these amazing costumes and props? Well, for me, um, when Star Wars was, I, I was there the opening day of, of Star Wars uh, at a, a theater in Southfield, Michigan. Uh, it was the old Americana Theater on Greenfield. And it was opening day, and what impressed me, I was 27 and had been working here, actually, for three years programming films already, and loved to hear audience responses to movies at the DIA, still do. In that theater, uh, a film that had not yet been really highly touted. In fact, the studio that released it didn't spend a ton on advertising. They had another film, science fiction film that summer that they thought was going to be their big hit. It was about giant cockroaches. It did not become Star Wars. Uh, but the audience knew. And what really excited me was hearing that audience plugging into the film. And I knew during the cantina scene that people were now uh, experiencing 
uh, resurgence, and we're going to experience a resurgence in science fiction, that was touching them deeply, that we had transcended just, oh, this is a genre of science fiction, I know what that's like. No, this was a great classic piece of storytelling and a myth that we've seen on screen in many different guises, whether it be Robin Hood or High Noon or uh, The Seahawks, so many films that have touched on these same themes of rising to the occasion and overthrowing bad. Um, why couldn't it be set in space? Feeling the audience respond to it that way, I knew that a kind of movie history was, was being made and that these films would last. And so 45 years later, uh, or not quite that many, but almost, uh, to, to f see these objects in a museum and at the Detroit Institute of Arts and to hear people going through the exhibition and talking to each other about the first time they experienced these things, as well as people who've never seen a Star Wars film, but are a kind of marveling at the artistry that was involved behind the scenes in creating these things, um, is, is really quite wonderful. And it proves once again to me that the movies are an art form um, as worthy of our attention as any other. And to have the DIA recognizing this, we've had a film series running here for 45 years that's been fantastically successful, but to be celebrating the cinema within the galleries of the DIA is, uh, I think, a, a wonderful moment for the museum's history and uh, a real uh, invitation to all of the people in, in this area and wherever else they're coming from to celebrate that, that joy of cinema in the same way and with the same respect they celebrate all the other arts. And I imagine this exhibit is attracting people who might not otherwise have visited the DIA. We think so, and, and based on uh, the early word during the first five weeks of the exhibition, uh, that does seem to be the case. And one of the things we're excited about is that they are indeed going off to explore other parts of the DIA. They're not just coming to Star Wars and leaving the building. They're seeing that there is so much that is designed here for people's enjoyment and study and pleasure and for families to discover and enjoy together that we think that Star Wars and the power of costume will act as a kind of gateway, an entrance to the world of museums and the world of art to make people realize that it shouldn't be a standoffish, elitist experience. It should be an experience for everyone because art is for everyone and what it says right on the front of this building built in 1927 was that it was here for the knowledge and enjoyment of the people of the city of Detroit and we simply are, are taking that very seriously and doing our best to continue that that tradition from generation to generation. So this exhibit is on display through the end of September? Yeah through September 30th um, Every day but Monday, you can come to this exhibition. Tickets are available in advance. If you live in the Tri-County area, uh, you get a $5 discount on an adult ticket. Uh, tickets are priced differently during weekdays and weekends, and there's a special low ticket price for young people. And one of the nice things about the exhibition is your ticket comes with a multimedia tour, which you can take and points out details about many of the objects here. Um, I comment on the uh, multimedia tour, as does uh, another curator of, of African art here at the DIA, Nee Quarkopom, and it's, it's really quite involving and interesting, and there's also a separate audio tour for youth uh, who come in to the exhibition, so you can listen either to the adult audio tour or the young people's audio tour, or both, because many of them cover different objects, um, and the tour is also available in Spanish, so it's, it's really just designed to be as inclusive as humanly possible and in every way I think it's it's fun. We're also very proud I must say of the installation itself. Designers and interpretive people here at the museum worked very hard to make this a fun experience going through the exhibition and to make it feel cinematic as you can tell we've been going into hyperspace here um, but to suggest the films uh, and to also have clips of many of the films rolling in different galleries so that you can see an example of how these costumes and creatures appeared ultimately on screen. Because yes, the steps are there from conception to fabrication of the costumes, and then the costumes are here, but they were all designed to be seen in motion. They were designed to be seen interacting with each other on film, not just standing the way they are. So we wanted to make sure that people had a chance to look at them uh, in motion. And there are some instructional uh, videos too, if that doesn't sound too off-putting, uh, about, for example, how R2-D2 and C-3PO 
uh, work and were inhabited and were conceived and designed, the actors who, who worked in them, um, and people talking about the costumes that they wear in the Star Wars films. Uh, and those videos are interspersed throughout the exhibition. So it, it's really kind of all-encompassing and worth more than one visit, I think. Well, it's a beautiful exhibit. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. Pleasure, Pleasure meeting you. Thank you for your time. You bet. At the DIA, I'm Joe Johnson for Comics, Beer, and Sci-Fi.